Okay, let's just close our eyes and let's pray and ask God to speak to us today from his word. Father, we thank you, God, for this opportunity. Holy Spirit, we pray. Would you speak to us from your word, Father? May your word continue to challenge us, inspire us, Lord. And God, as your word declares that you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. And so, Father, I pray, Lord, may the truth of God be revealed unto us, Father, that we will not just do anything out of a religious practice, Lord, that the truth of God will give us a revelation, Lord. And so, Father, we pray, Lord, speak to us and minister to us, Lord, from your word. We thank you, God. In Jesus' name, Father, we pray. Amen. Well, the sermon notes are uploaded onto the YouVersion Bible app, and if you scan the QR code, it'll take you right up there. And uh, we're continuing our series on the, uh, the promise for this year, the enlarge. And uh, the last uh, six weeks or so, you know, as we are looking at different aspects of this promise, and every time God gives us a promise, we need to become intentional to believe and join our hearts to the promise. Because when in the believing and joining our hearts to the promise, you would see the manifestation of God's promise come to fulfillment in our lives. You've got to just become intentional. And, you know, the last six weeks of going through this promise and various aspects of this promise, you know, we're going to look at uh, one of the important aspects today, which I'm going to do like a series for the next few weeks. And I want to talk about enlarge your finances. And I'm sure we are all praying for our finances. We are constantly praying. In fact, it's one of the predominant prayer requests. And as I traveled across the globe, anywhere, regardless of what context, what nation, what culture you are in, there are two predominant prayer requests that always comes. One is for a physical body healing, you know, concerning healing. Now people come in and say, can you please pray because I have an ailment or a sickness that I'm going through. And the second uh, predominant prayer request is, would you please pray for a breakthrough in my life, a financial breakthrough, or a job condition, or a business condition, you know, anything to do with our finances. If these are the two pressing needs globally in the church or across humanity, we might as well learn how, you know, not only just praying about it, but also learning about how to experience the blessing of God manifest in our lives. The third epistle of John, you know, verse 2 says, Beloved, I wish that you may prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. You know, if you, have, if you want to know the, 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 the heart of God, God wants us to be successful. God wants us to be doing well in life. God wants us to prosper and not just... Um, finances, but every area of our lives, God wants us to do well. But in this particular context, in, in relation to what we're looking at, the series that I want to talk about, that God wants us to be prosperous. Poverty, lack is not God's idea for us. How do I know that? The Bible says, Jesus became poor that you and I could become rich. I don't know if you've ever heard that scripture in the Bible. All right, it says, you know, he became poor that you and I can become rich. Now, being, you know, living in abundance is not the problem. But if the abundance takes us away from God, then that's a problem. Like any other blessing, all right? Like people ask us to pray, you know, pastor, pray for, pray for a job. And you, you, know, you pray and you get your dream job. And the, just the same dream job takes you away from God. You have no, don't have time to read the Bible. You don't have time to meditate. You don't have time to go to church. You know, it just takes you away. That's not what God is looking at. God wants us a holistic approach, development in our lives. He wants us to do well in life. And so, part of our series, and I'm praying, and you know, especially as pastors, we are praying, and I'm praying constantly that the church will go through a financial increase and blessing. When I say the church, I'm talking about each one of you, and we are being very intentional to pray that God would bless each one of you to grow in your finances. You know, nothing wrong in it. You know, we got to be intentional. The Bible says you have not because you ask not. So you got to ask God. You got to pray to God and constantly believe in God. So as part of our series for Enlarge this year, I'm praying that God, the year 2024, will be a year where God will increase our capacity in the area of finances. God will increase you know, our resources in the area of finances that we will 
always have all sufficiency in all things at all times in Jesus name. That is the heart of God for each one of us. Now listen to this very carefully. Any promise that God gives to us, we need to become intentional. Like how we picked up the promise for this year and we are you know, looking things around the, the promise of Isaiah 54 to enlarge your boundaries. You know, stretch forth for God is going to bring an increase. You shall expand. You shall grow. And I'm praying that God will bring increase in each one of your life, that you will expand and grow in your finances, that you will do well in life, that you will always live in all sufficiency. That is our prayer. But as like any other promise, just praying is not enough. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that we should not pray. Prayer has power. Prayer can do a lot of things. But just praying alone would not c accomplish everything. Can God divinely, supernaturally, sovereignly bless us? Absolutely. He, there's nothing too hard for the Lord, says the Bible. But the, the, the common way in which God functions is that God wants us to enter into a partnership with him where we have a responsibility to do our part and God is committed to do his part. Right? We are constantly, God is inviting us into a partnership like in, in any area of our lives, not just finances, in any area of our lives, right? You believe God for healing, now, apart from just praying for, you're continuously trusting God and you begin to confess that. You know, there is something that you got to do. You got to confess it. Even when you're feeling sick, you confess the divine health is your proportion. In doing so, the natural will be changed over the super, by the supernatural. That's how it works. Let me give you a couple of examples. You know, in the Old Testament, Moses carried a shepherd's staff. All right? And God told him, and you know, if, you, if you know the background in Exodus 3, God uh, tells him, you know, what's in your hand? And he says, I have a shepherd's staff. He says, all right, I'm going to use it. He throws it onto the ground and it becomes a serpent. You know, God does all kinds of miracles through that. But one of the profound miracles was when they're in, right in the front of Red Sea. And when Moses looks to God, God says, stretch forth the rod or the staff over the Red Sea. The stretching forth was his responsibility. The parting of the Red Sea was God's responsibility. Amen. You, you understand what I'm talking about, right? So we all have. Now, I'm not saying that we need to work our way to see the promise fulfillment. No, we're not working. We are partnering with God where we got to do our responsibility. Like when Peter saw Jesus walking on the water, he said, Lord, if it's you, ask me to come. And Jesus says, come. The word come had the power to hold him, but Peter had to first step out. In the stepping out, Peter fulfilled his responsibility the sustenance on the water against the gravity, God did it. All right? Likewise, in Mark 16, he says, you shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. The laying of hands is, my, is our responsibility. The bringing of healing and touch is God's responsibility. Are we clear on that? So, so that's why praying is important, but doing is also important. We are into a partnership that God is calling us. Now, financial blessing and increase and uh, breakthroughs come by praying, absolutely. But apart from praying, there are principles set up in the Bible by God that when you follow those principles, you would see the manifestation of those principles along with your prayer, the, you know, it, it manifests in your life. Now, the greatest challenge for consistency for any believer, listen to this very carefully. The greatest challenge for any believer to have a consistent practice of any principle is lack of revelation. All right? Let me explain that. Whatever you do without a revelation, it becomes a religious practice and you cannot sustain it for a long time. Right? Like when growing up, you know, we tell the kids, read the Bible, read the Bible, pray. Right? And over a period of time, as you keep growing, you understand that your sustenance is linked with the, the Word of God. If you don't understand that, then it becomes a, a job. Right? That's why, oh, don't I didn't read the Bible, you open it up and then you do a lucky lottery, just open it up and then some, read some scripture, you feel good about it. I finished my job, I tick a box. That's a religious practice, right? Now, what, the reason why you do that is because you have fear. Listen to this. But when you understand that my spiritual sustenance is only linked in the word of, by the studying of the word of God, then when you do that, you know, when you get that, that becomes a revelation. And when it becomes a revelation, then the reason why you do that is because you know the impact of that. You're not doing it because somebody is asking you to do it. 
All right? Likewise, you know, any practice that you do, likewise, even uh, with our, you know, with the whole financial principles, there are certain things that God has taught, shown us in the scriptures so that we know <clears throat> what we need to do in order to, you know, apart from praying, to experience a breakthrough, a financial increase to come into our lives. It's a biblical order, and the reason why we don't do it, we, you know, if you don't have a revelation, we do just a practice. That's why when, you know, giving can become tiresome. Giving can become, uh, you know, boring. And, uh, and in, you know, I, not, I, I, I acknowledge that in some context, some church context, okay, in some places, the church feel abused in the area of giving because they are constantly uh, motivated out of fear to give, otherwise something happens in your life. I mean, we're going to deal with all that today, okay? And then the uh, people feel drained out because of constant manipulation, using the word of God and causing people to give. Almost like a pressure constantly being put on people to give. Otherwise, this will happen. Otherwise, that will happen. Otherwise, God will not bless. So the reason why you're giving is because now your motivation is either fear or lack of what you mean, because we don't really understand what is the purpose of giving. All right, so that's why I said any practice without revelation becomes a religion. All right, so never do it. Then you cannot sustain anything consistently because you don't have a revelation. So what I would like to do today is that I want to start a series on part of enlarge your finances. I want to talk about five principles. And if you can just bring that up onto the screen, please. There are five principles which I believe, and I've done this over, over the last few years. And for all those who've heard this, I wanted to keep your hearts open because there is something new that God would speak through. And every time I repeat something, you know, I've always seen God speak to me something new and blessed me. And for all those who haven't heard, you know, this is going to change your heart uh, and, and your entire perception. That's why to teach the truth is my responsibility. How you receive it and how God brings a change in your life is between you and God. All right, so keep your hearts open. And I know that there are some people here, you know, you've had a background or you come from a background where, you know, you've been manipulated to give. But that's not what I believe in. You know, at Crosspoint, we always believe in teaching the word and what happens is between you and God, okay? So the first principle would be the principle of giving and the second one would be the principle of first fruits, which talks about the tithe. The principle of multiplication, the, which is a free will offering, the principle of generosity, sacrificial offering, the principle of stewardship, how we can be responsible in our spending. And this is going to change your life and because we're going to deal with a lot of practical aspects, okay, even to the point, you know, how you need to be intentional to save and invest and do all that, okay? And you're wondering if this is taught in church, yes, it should be taught in church because it's a biblical thing, all right? So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to first deal with the principle of giving. Why do we need to give? Where did this whole giving thing come up? Did one crazy pastor one morning got up and said, I'm going to take an offering from people? We're not, is that somebody a man's idea or is it a God's idea? Okay, so we're going to look at you know, the principle of giving. Giving is an expression of love. Right? That's why we give gifts to people that we love. Right? And anybody that you have an affection for a love or when you look after them, you know, giving comes as a natural uh, response because of love. Right? Listen to this. And I, you can give and not love, but you cannot love and not give. Let me say that again. You can give and not love, but you cannot love and not give. Right? So giving is an act of love. It's, it's an expression of love. And then giving is also an act of gratitude. You're thankful about what God has done in your life. You give. All right? You give gift. You give your offering because you're thankful. And giving is also an act of worship. A lot of times we think that worship is only about music and you know, singing a song or a hymn. But giving, when you give, you, it is an act of worship. All right? Now we're going to look at this whole principle of giving. You know, people say, and people argue about it. They say, oh, the giving whole, the, the whole giving thing is Old Testament. You know, it's not very clear in the New Testament. 
especially when it comes to tithing, a lot of people. So, you know, it's a very interesting thing. You know, the, the whole giving principle has been taken to sort certain extreme that some people have fully manipulated and put the whole church in fear and took offering. The other side of the extreme is because of the abuse, pastors are not teaching on giving. It's like, you know, most of the, some pastors don't touch on revelation. They said, oh, let's not open the Pandora's box. This whole thing, you know, the moment we talk about giving, it just brings a lot of offense to people. And this morning, I want you to listen. I'm sure there are people who are offended. I'm sure there are people who are tired. I'm sure there are people who felt that they've been taken advantage of. But I want you to keep your hearts open because this is an amazing principle. Anything that's done to an extreme is, you know, it, you know it's, it's not right. You know, but you need to have a balance. All right, so the whole principle of giving is not related or is not uh, confined. Maybe that's the right word. Confined to the New Testament or the Old Testament. Okay, let's look at uh, Genesis chapter 14 and verse 20. Genesis 14 and verse 20. Now, let me give you the background of this uh, scripture. This scripture is at a time when Abraham goes with 318 servants who were raised up in his house. The sons of the house, the Bible says. And these are the people who were raised in the house. And Abraham goes because his nephew Lot was in trouble again. All right? He was captured by a few kings. And then Abraham goes with 318 people. He defeats them, redeems Lot and his family. He, he brings the Lot out of the trouble. And while he's coming, back in those days, uh, you know, every time somebody con had a conquest, they also get the wealth of that nation. Okay, So Abraham got a lot of wealth. And while he was coming back, he meets the high priest called Melchizedek. And Melchizedek, when he sees Abraham, he blesses him. Are you still following the story? Please don't sleep. I can see from here, okay? So Abraham is now happy. Not only he had a conquest, he redeemed his... Nephew Lord, he's coming with a lot of wealth, meets the high priest, Melchizedek. And Melchizedek blesses him. That's where we pick up this, uh, the context of this scripture. And he blessed, he said, Blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hands. So that's the blessing that Melchizedek gave to Abraham. As a result of that blessing pronounced on his life, the Bible says Abraham gave him a tithe of all. Now, the word tithe means one-tenth. Okay, we're going to deal with that next week. Don't worry about it. So, here we see nobody taught Abraham to give. It's a personal revelation of his relationship with God. So, now, do you see that? That this is not confined to the Old Testament or the New Testament. The Old Covenant was established when Moses, from Exodus, right? When Moses brought the children of Israel out, God gave the Ten Commandments and all these laws. That's where the Old Covenant, the Old Testament kind of really came into functionality. But this one is even uh, much before than the law was established. So you see the principle, the principle of giving and faith is, no, is not linked or confined to either of the Testaments. It's a biblical principle. It's a kingdom principle. All right. So he says, and Abraham, as a result of just receiving the blessing, he gave. So the whole purpose of giving, you know, giving is a kingdom principle. That's why, you know, have you ever thought about it? You know, when, when the book of Revelation comes to fulfillment, okay, and then God comes back the second time, and the church, everybody who accepted him to be the Lord of his, their lives, and born again, we are going to live in his presence. Did you know that you don't have to work and you don't have to pay for anything because God is going to look after us? I don't know if you ever thought like that, right? Now, the reason why God looks after us is because his nature is give, to give. For God so loved the world that he... That's why people in every religion, ideology, faith background, even in corporations believe that charity, giving out, right, always brings certain kind of an increase into their lives. Or a blessing. That's why everybody believes. That's why, uh, what do you call? You have the social, um, corporate social responsibility. I mean, of course, the government makes you spend that, but 
you know, some car most of the corporations believe that a certain portion of their income or profits need to be given back into the community. Where did that come from? It, it comes from because it's a kingdom principle. Right? You see that now? So giving is not man's idea. It is God's idea. It is God who initiated, established the fact of giving. Okay? So now we're going to go a little deeper to help understand this whole concept of giving, why it is misunderstood, misrepresented, and um, manipulated is because we have not understood the, the scriptures right. And one of the most misunderstood, misquoted scriptures comes from Malachi chapter 3, 8, 9, and 10. And I wanted to fix your eyes onto the screen as we run through this. Malachi chapter 3, verse 8, 9, and 10. I'm sure that anybody you know, who, who's in any kind of a prayer meeting, all right, or the scriptures talk about, and then, then once you read the scripture, you go out with fear. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, how? In what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse. For you have robbed me. Because you didn't bring your tithes and your offerings, you are cursed. Even this whole nation. Now I'm sure, how many of you, you all read this scripture, or heard this scripture, right? We all heard this scripture. So now, please give, otherwise you will invite a curse on your life. That's how it's been taught, okay? And now we give because we are scared. I don't want to be cursed by God, so let me just get rid of my tithe. That's the mentality, that's the attitude that the church has come into. But let me explain to you that what this scripture means and what is the origin. We need to look at how did this come in and what's the explanation of that. Because this is the most manipulated scripture because people think, that you are, if you don't give your tithes and your offerings, you will be cursed. Now, before we go any deta into any details, listen to this very carefully. There is no curse that is valid or active upon anybody who's accepted Jesus to be the Lord of their lives. Amen? Whether it is generational curse, whether it is family curse, whether it is neighbor's curse, doesn't matter. Well, can people still curse? Yes, because you can't control somebody else's behavior. Is there power in witchcraft to cast a spell and a curse on us? Yes, but it will not affect me because my Bible says that greater is he who is in me than he that is in the world. All right? Now, listen to this. You, know, you can't pray, say, Lord, let nobody curse me. No, instead you say, Lord, I don't, I, I thank you because no curse will affect me because I'm, I'm purchased by the blood of Jesus. Now, this is on the side note, but I want you to really understand my stand on it, okay? There is no curse that is effective and it will have any impact on your life today if you have accepted Christ. Galatians chapter 3, this is not in your notes, and I, if, I don't know if I can bring it up. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13. I want to quickly run through that. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13 talks, you know, it, it gives a little idea about this particular powerful scripture Galatians 3 and verse 13. Is it possible to bring it onto the screen, please? It says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. So when Christ died on the cross, every curse that's on our lives, whether it's generational or doesn't matter what curse it is, Christ has nailed it to the cross. And now what do we have? Look at verse 14. That the, verse 14 please. That the blessing of Abraham might come upon who? You know who's the Gentiles? Anybody who's outside of the covenant of God. Anybody who receives Christ is now. So he says, when you have accepted Christ, the curse is taken away. The blessing is on our lives. Amen. So there is no curse on our lives. Okay, so keep that in mind. And now let's go back and look at this particular scripture, Mal Malachi chapter 3, verse 8, 9, and 10. 8, 9, uh, 8 and 9. He says, Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, In what have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You're cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Now, let us look at what is this curse all about. Now, just before that, you know, a common question for us to think about it. How can a loving God can also curse? 
right? You know, God has to make up his mind. You know, he, how can one, you know, somehow, somehow we think that he wakes up one morning and says, I'm going to bless everybody. The next day morning, you know, he's cranky, he's upset, okay? And he says, I want to curse everybody. That's not how God functions, all right? He's not bipolar. Thank God, all right? So we misunderstood the scripture. How can a loving God who says, for God so loved the world? Lord, please make up your mind. Are you loving or you want to curse? It's a valid question. It's a paradox. You need to think about it, right? So what does it mean? We have misunderstood this scripture and misquoted and we live in fear. That's why the Bible says in Rome, uh, John 8, 32, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. What will set you free is a revelation, the truth being revealed to us. So we're going to look at the origin of curse. What is this curse that the Bible is talking about? Yes, is, is there a curse? Yes, but what's this curse all about? Okay, go to Genesis 3 verse 16. Genesis 3 and verse 16, and I'm really reading from the New Living Translation. Genesis 3 and verse 16. Now, to give you the back, background of the story, God, this is after God comes onto the scene when Adam and Eve fell, right? They disobeyed God, and then God comes in, they hide, and God con had converses there with them, and this is where we pick up the story. And this is what God said, okay? Then he said to the woman, Eve, I will sharpen the pain of your pregnancy. And in pain, you will give, right? Because of disobedience, right? The consequence of sin is pain. So to the woman, he said that in pain, you will uh, give birth. And he says, uh, look at the second part. And you will desire to control And all the men said, see, did you see that? Nobody said amen, even in the first service. Because you are sitting right next to your woman. Brothers, you can wink at me. As a sign to say, Pastor, amen, I believe in it. I don't have the audacity to, to say verbally, but I wink at you. As a sign of agreement. Amen. All right, anyway, so we're not going to deal with that. That's for another time. And you will desire to control your husband, but he will rule over you, okay? That's where all the confusion comes from. But that's what's specific to the woman, okay? Now let's look at what God said to the man. Verse 17. Then to the man he said, Since you listened to your wife and ate from the tree, this is what's happening. Yeah, whose fruit I commanded you not to eat. He says, the ground, what? Because of you. Now, I want to spend a little time here to bring clarity to help understand. Listen to this. God did not curse Adam. He said, the, 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 the source of your provision is cursed. Right? Now, for a lot too long, we thought that if I don't give, God is going to curse me because he's upset. That's not what he's talking about. That's why we need to look at what is the origin of this uh, curse. Where did this come from? So what God said, until then, listen to this, God took care of them. The, what changed at this point of time? Divine provision was a natural thing that Adam and Eve experienced. They did not have to wake up one morning and say, oh my goodness, I need to till the ground, I need to plow, I need to sow, and I need to wait for a harvest. Because in the Garden of Eden, God provided everything. He said, Enjoy, rule, subdue, uh, have dominion, replenish. You know, then said he gave him to be an in charge. Divine provision was the blessing of God for man before fall. Are you with me so far? Divine provision. God, God took care, God took care of Adam and Eve. As a result of disobedience, he said, "Now your divine provision will be cut off. You need to work for it." All right? So now he's saying that your provision is cut off. Your source of supply is affected because of sin. And then look at this. Uh, can you go, go from the beginning, please? Uh, verse 17. Since you listened to your wife and ate from the tree, whose fruit I commanded you not to eat, the ground is cursed because of you. Now look at the effect of this uh, the, uh, the curse. 
all your life you will now what struggle work hard that's why we struggle 12 hours 14 hours we struggling constantly right you know, every day we constantly struggle work hard to scratch a living from it so that's why now god is god doesn't want us to become lazy okay that's not what he's talking about somebody who enjoyed divine provision is now living under the effect of a curse where you have to work for yourself to provide for you and for your family that's where it started look at verse 18 it will grow thorns and thistles for you until then there were there were no thorns thorns is a consequence of this curse he says now your ground that is naturally producing he says there will be thorns thistles and weeds that will come out of it right now listen to this he says look at god's divine grace even in his punishment he made a provision it says you still got to work hard and you can survive and said though you will eat of its grain so god did not stop the provision but he says now the provision becomes tough you you see that so god says now it will grow thorns and thistles for you though it will you will eat of its grain look at verse 90 by the sweat of your brow you will have food to eat until you die right so that is the effect of curse so what god said that because you disobeyed me adam now you got to work and you have to work you got to toil so if you're toiling if you're struggling if you're working hard i want you to know that's part of the the curse that came upon the source of our supply but not on us you are not cursed but the source of supply has now become difficult is still with me let's quickly look at the the effect of this curse hegia chapter 1 and verse 5 hegia chapter 1 and verse 5 now therefore thus says the lord of hosts consider your ways you have sown much and you have br- you bring in little oh that's like my office right somebody says i work too hard but they may peanuts you eat but you're not enough you drink but you're not filled you clothe but you're not warm and he who earns wages and i'm sure a lot of people can relate with this earns wages to put it into a bag with holes by the time you realize it's all gone that's all part of the effect of that curse on our sustenance right suffering and toil are part of the curse god put upon this world because of sin earlier they were not supposed to suffer and toil and work hard but he said by out of the sweat of your brow you're going to make bring food onto the table adam and eve were forced to find their own food and shelter adam had to fight weeds thorns and thistles to 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 live out his life while eve had to suffer in her child birth okay so the effect of that curse is that you bring in but everything is gone now what is the purpose of giving listen to this okay now go back to malachi 3 and let's read verse 8 9 and 10 now it makes sense okay now we can see it from a different perspective will a man rob god yet you have robbed me but you say how in what way have we robbed you in tithes and offerings you are cursed with a curse for you have robbed me even this whole nation listen to this giving is god's idea to negate the effect of that curse over our lives giving is god's idea to negate the power of this curse over our lives now is god saying that you should not work hard no you will work hard we need to work hard until we go into the ground we will work hard but you will see the effect of this curse on your life being negated cancelled and god protects you that when you work you will have enough when you work you have satisfaction when you work and bring in money you have enough all the time so giving is god's method to protect you and cover you from the effect of this curse upon you and your family amen it says you're cursed with the curse all right you were then he says bring all the tithe into the storehouse we're going to deal with that next week why we need to bring tithe that there may be food in my house and try me now test me now says the lord of hosts okay 
Look at that, the next part of the verse. If I will not open for you the what? The windows of heaven and pour out such a blessing that you will not have room enough. So there is something that God is talking about. He's saying that now, he's saying that if you bring your tithes and your offer, if you give, God is going to cause the same job and the same business and the same thing that you have as your source of supply. He says that through that, the blessings will come that you will not have enough to contain it. The toil and hard work continues, but in your giving, you are now activating the power of God to supersede the effect of curse on our lives where God brings in this edge of protection around us that we will, he says, I will not, if I will not pour out, uh, open the windows of heaven for you and pour out such a blessing that you will not have room enough to receive it. Look at verse 11. And I will rebuke the effect of that curse for your sake, or the devourer, so that the effect of that curse will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the wine fail to bear fruit. All right, what God is saying, that he's going to bless your work, he's going to bless your business, he's going to protect what your source of supply. He says, when you give, God is saying, I'm going to rebuke, I'm going to cause I'm going to rebuke the effect of that curse over your life in your giving. So your giving is you're doing yourself a favor by giving. Because in giving, God is saying, test me now, prove me now, try me now, if I will not open up the windows of heaven and pour out such a blessing that you will not have room enough to contain. And then I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. Because you are now acting in a... I mean, look at this, God allowed the consequence of sin to come, God also made a provision how to negate that effect of that consequence over our lives. And that is the principle of giving. Amen? Let me read to you a scripture from Genesis chapter 8. And uh, the background of the story is Genesis chapter 8 talks about Noah after the flood, 40 days and 40 nights. God wipes out everything, restarts everything. You remember that? Now, he sends a dove, and eventually he comes out of the ark and he sees the dry ground. The first thing that Noah does, Genesis 8 and verse 20. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offering. The first thing that Noah did was he gave an offering to the Lord. Why would he give? As an act of gratitude. Because this was the only dude who was pro protected. All right, while everybody is wiped out, he was the only guy and his family was protected. So, natural response of gratitude is give. Okay? Look at verse 21. And the Lord, what? Smelled the soothing aroma from this offering. When you give, that's why the Bible says, give cheerfully, not out of fear. Give not because out of compulsion, not because, you know, somebody's forcing you. That's why the Bible says in 1 Corinthians, which we're going to deal with later. Give, God loves a cheerful giver. Give out of what the best you have. So when you give, it says it is now an offering that goes, that brings in a, a soothing aroma. Then the Lord said in his heart, look at this, as a result of the giving, I will never curse, never again curse the ground for man's sake. No, you will never read anywhere that God cursed man. He says, I will never again curse the ground. For man's sake, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, nor will I ever again destroy. Right? Then immediately after that, God establishes a system. Verse 22. While the earth remains, which means as long as this earth remains, first one is seed time, harvest. Cold heat, winter, summer. Okay? All that comes in. My point is, as long as the earth remains, what God is saying that you have to sow for you to receive. It's a principle God set up. Amen. Even though the ground is, ground is cursed, even though the effect of curse is still there until God recreates the whole new earth for us, until then what God has made a provision to anybody who put their faith in God and says, give your tithes and your offering. In the giving, and when you give it with a great attitude, he says, seed time. He says, first is what? Seed time, giving, then the harvest time. That's part of the nature of God now. The first thing that he establishes, he says, as long as the earth remains, seed time, harvest time, uh, cold heat, winter, summer, day and night will not 
stop or cease. You see that? So giving will never stop until either you die or God comes back and recreates everything. So that's the principle that God has established. So the principle of giving, while we are praying and ex expecting God to enlarge our finances, while we are believing God to enlarge our finances, let us also ask God to speak to us and give us a revelation that the principles of giving or the principle, the financial principles that God put in his scriptures, when you follow that, it has an effect over your life. Amen. Your giving activates the power of God to stop the effect of curse over your life. That's why some of us, some of you, you work really hard and you still feel that you're stuck and you're not progressing. You never see any progress. Giving activates the power of God so that the effect of curse will not be upon your life. That's what the Bible says in, in the New Testament. It says that, it says, I'm praying that you will have all sufficiency in all things at all times in Jesus' name. And that is my prayer to the church at Crosspoint. And this is my prayer to everybody. With, you know, when you prosper, the church prospers. When you prosper, the community prospers. Amen. That's why we, you know, the teaching of the truth of the word of God is my responsibility and how God stirs up your heart of what God does to you is between you and God. That's why God never puts an amount. He says, give the best of what you have. For somebody, a hundred rupees can be the best of what they have. For somebody, 10,000 can be their best. That's why we are never called to compare. The widow who had two mites was appreciated because that was the best of what she had. For some reason, the church thought, the bigger we give, the more we are going to be impressing God. No, the best of what we have. If you have too much, the best of what you have. That's between you and God. And that's why uh, you know, I believe that we need to teach the word without any compromise so that you can learn the principle and believe that your giving activates the power of God to protect you from the curse of the ground. Amen. Can I have the team of police? So why don't we all stand to our feet and let's, um, I want to pray with you right now. Let's take a few moments. If you are believing, believing with me, along with me, that this year, 2024, will be a year of enlargement in your finances. Breakthroughs to come. You know, divinely things to shift from lack into abundance. If that's what your prayer is today, I want you to join with me as I pray. And I want you to open your hearts for God to you know, it's challenge you to follow those principles. Because as you pray and as you follow, you will see breakthrough come into your lives. Amen. Let's close our eyes. Father, we thank you, God, for your word today. Holy Spirit, I pray. May this word take a deep root in our spirit, Lord, that it will bear 30, 60, and 100-fold our west, Lord. May this word liberate us, Father. That giving in, at cross point will never be out of compulsion or necessity or out of fear, Lord. Because you love a cheerful giver, Lord. And make us cheerful givers, Lord, because of the revelation that we have on these principles. And Father, we are praying and believing for expansion in the area of finances, Lord. And as we walk through this uh, this series, Lord, on different principles, Lord, I pray would you radically change our circumstances, Lord, that people will come from, Lord, uh, lack into abundance in Jesus' name, Father, that we will experience, Lord, all sufficiency in all things at all times in Jesus' name, Lord, that people will experience, Lord, your abundance in their lives. We thank you, God. I want to give an opportunity to anybody who's never made a commitment to follow Jesus. Maybe you're visiting with us for the first time or you've been coming here for a while. If all you walked away from God, I don't know, maybe today, great moment for you to come back to God. Or you know, give your life to Jesus. Is there somebody like that who says, I want to give my life to Jesus? Can you just wave your hand at me? I would like to pray for you. Anybody like that? Thank you so much. God bless you. I want you to repeat this prayer after me. And I want everybody to join with me as I lead these people in this prayer. Say, Lord Jesus, I thank you for speaking to me. I make a choice to receive Christ into my life. I confess that I have sinned against you and I need a savior and I receive Jesus as my Lord and my savior. Fill me with your Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you, God, for these people. Lord, I pray their blessing 
Pour out your spirit upon them, Lord. We thank you, God. Lord, I speak your blessing upon everybody, Lord. In Jesus' name, Father, we pray. Amen.